the Amazon review killer. He would do these different reviews on products. Here we've got a chainsaw. He says, works excellent. Getting the neighbor to stand still while you chase him with it is hard enough without having an easy to use chainsaw. This little collapsible shovel. Keep in the car for when you have to hide bodies and you left the full size shovel at home. These are the type of locks that they cut off the Connex container. So these yeah. are the locks he bought. Saw locks, have five on a shipping container. Won't stop them but sure will slow them down. Can you imagine the mindset of somebody to not only write these types of reviews, purchase the items, then actually do all the things that he did? Well, he's a serial killer. At this point, yeah. he's killed seven people. And let's be honest, Kayla would have been his eighth victim if she wasn't found when she was. This guy is f***ing wacko. Todd Kolhep was arrested after a woman was found chained in a container on his property. Kolhep confessed to killing four people at Superbike Motorsports in 2003. He's like, okay, now it's time for my show. He says, sit back and watch this. Welcome to Socialite Crime Club. So socialites have begun to notice that we do a lot of cell phone tracking that leads to a lot of dead people. They're asking if we have any crimes that we've tracked cell phones where we find somebody alive. Do you have a case for that? I do. And you know, even a blind squirrel finds a nut now and again. Depends on the agency we're working with. We're going to go back to 2016. Okay. Anderson, South Carolina. Hmm? August. A little humid, a little hot. Hot, sticky. Been to a handful of places in South Carolina along the beachfront. Mm -hmm. Love those areas. I love Nags Head area. Yeah. I love Hilton Head. Is Nags Head South Carolina? I No, I think it's North Carolina. Yeah. Is it? It's right. Carolinas. It's, it's, it's the in the Carolinas. Carolinas. I know it's really beautiful. Love the beach side. Haven't been inland that far. And in August of 2016, we were teaching a 40-hour basic cell phone investigations course, if you will with the Anderson Police Department. It's kind of a cool, quaint little town. I'd never been there before, but it's actually, it won me over. It's this really cool, just classic old Southern town. Really cool little downtown area. They had some really nice bars. I had a good time. It was a, it was a good week. Did you eat fried green tomatoes? I think I did, twice. I have to have those every time we go somewhere in the South. And that is like the classic area for them, Because right? you never see them on menus on the no, West Coast. No. And it is a small town. It's about 30,000 uh, people. I was there, I want to say the last week of August, first week of September of 2016, Monday through Friday. And this is leading into Labor Day weekend. So make some good connections and uh, the class goes as planned. I did notice while I was there, this is a part of the United States that the local law enforcement just hasn't done a lot of cell phone tracking. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the techniques and methodologies that we were getting into were really brand new for them. Well, we find that in a lot of small towns, though. Yeah, yeah. And the timing could not have been better. One of the Anderson police officers who did a lot of the facilitation of putting the class together, his name is Brad. He's kind of our point of contact. So I come home, Labor Day weekend. We all go do whatever we did in 2016 on Labor Day weekend. I want to say maybe Wednesday, Thursday, the following week, Brad calls me. He says, hey, thanks for the class. Awesome. Learned a lot of good stuff. Caught me a, a missing persons this week, though. And I've got some questions. We want to use what we learned in the class on this missing persons investigation. Can you help us? Yeah, absolutely. What do you Great. Got? That's exactly what's supposed to happen. That's exactly how it goes. In these calls, I need to preface this daily. It wasn't uncommon at all for me to get phone calls from all over the country to be like, hey, we've got this missing person. What do we do? Mm -hmm. So I walk Brad through very quickly. Okay, here's what you want to get. Here's the type of data you want to get. You have a couple options. You can use exigency if you can articulate in any way that these potential victims, if you will, they're missing people. Mm -hmm. If they are in any threat at all, go under exigency. Let's define exigency a little bit more for our socialites. So there is an exception to the search warrant rule, if you will, for getting phone records. And if I can articulate somebody's life is in immediate danger, I can sidestep a search warrant and I can fill out this form to a phone company and say, I, officer so-and-so, is hereby declaring an emergency. It's a life or death emergency. If we don't receive these records immediately, in the time it would take me to get a search warrant and go through the regular procedures, somebody could die. Now let's talk about the need for a search warrant 
to either follow that exigent request or demand in addition to the demand itself. Yeah. So or when I say it allows in. you to sidestep the search warrant, it doesn't necessarily replace that. So what it does is it allows me as the investigator to expedite getting the records. And then I'm supposed to replace that request with a search warrant at the first opportunity I have. Now, what a lot of people don't realize when you don't use exigency, you can't articulate it for whatever reason, it can take a really long time to get these records. So I have a brief conversation with Brad. I don't know the details of his case. I just know they have two missing people and we'll get into that here in just a second. But I explained to him, if you can articulate that there's any fear that something bad has happened, go under exigency. If not, just write your search warrant. Here's a search warrant template. Here's what you're going to ask for. When you get the records, if you need any help at all, give me a call. Sure. And that's kind of where we left it. What I didn't know at the time is the two people that are missing is a Kayla Brown and a Charlie Carver. They are a couple. They're out of Anderson, South Carolina. Not really normal for either of them to just disappear like this. Mm -hmm. And their white car is also missing. I think it was Charlie's car. And I've got a little picture of a flyer here that has both of their pictures and then the white car and some, some details. Now I'm showing you this flyer, but I didn't know this was the case at all. I, I took a very quick phone call of, hey, we have some missing people. It happened around Labor Day. We want to track their phones. Can you help us? Yep. Here's okay. what you need to ask for. And they're AT&T phones. Okay. Don't think much more about it. I go on to the next phone call, the next little bit of work. And we talked a little bit about agency versus non-agency. This case changed the way that I approach this topic. If you have a missing person, if you're going to take a report for a missing person and there's a possibility that that person is alive, you need to run under exigency. And where this becomes an issue is some people go missing on purpose. <laughs> and they're not missing. They're avoiding the people who are reporting them missing. <laughs> and unfortunately, law enforcement deals with this a lot. So it's common for law enforcement to somewhat dismiss. You probably have heard, oh, until they're missing for 48 hours, there's nothing we can do. Right. Yeah, that's not the case. Like right. if you go missing for two hours, there's things law enforcement can do. And we've covered this in previous episodes. Yeah, but unfortunately, because there's so much repetition of certain people going missing and they're not really missing, it starts to develop into this reoccurring theme of, well, they're not really missing. They just well, don't want to be found. Especially if there's a history of maybe somebody having other criminal activity in their record and it's a common thing that somebody goes missing or especially when it's adults and they go missing with another adult that they're commonly seen with. In this case, they should have ran under agency. And I, I have to take part of the blame here. I think if I would have asked a few more questions, if I would have known a little bit more, I think I definitely would have pushed a little harder of, hey, Brad, you need to run this right now. This is interesting. But I didn't know that. And I didn't ask. I was just well, busy doing other things. What would Brad have told you that would have made you ask more questions it's not normal for these two to go missing together that there is potentially some foul play involved here because the family now that i've gone back and i've researched this case which we're going to get into the family definitely suspected foul play okay something wasn't right and was brad suspecting foul play at all at this while the family was or was he just kind of on the the hinge of i, I think he was on the right. hinge but you know to me it comes down to this if i go under agency and then i replace it with a search warrant and i screw it all up all that means is i can't use those records in court to prosecute somebody right if i do all of that and i find them their <laughs> there's life no harm. is still saved yeah. right right there's no harm so it's one of those things we can err on the side of caution, go under agency, find these people, put it to bed and feel better about ourselves. And we don't lose anything. We're not violating people's rights. We're not losing evidence of fruit of the poisonous tree type stuff. Right. I would much rather save somebody's life and be able to say like, okay, well, let's move on. Right. Than not. And in right. this case, the not's going to come back to haunt us. Mm. Okay. So they're going to go non exigent what this means is they're going to write a search warrant. They're going to send the search warrant through typical channels to the cell phone providers. The cell phone providers are then going to process that search warrant just like they normally would. It can take up to six weeks to get phone records in the United States under a search warrant. And that's if you push the provider sometimes. <laughs> like calling weekly saying, hey, I need these records. I need these records. I need these records. Yeah. And actually citing statute that says you have to have them within a reasonable time frame right and when you go under agency a lot of times 24 hours or less 48 hours max 
you can get those records really quick. Mm -hmm. In this case, it's going to take six weeks to get these phone records back. Actually, it takes almost seven because you got to figure they go missing. There's a week before they get the search warrants actually served. Mm -hmm. And then there's six weeks. And then there's going to be some time to process that data once it comes back. Did they ever ask about running under exigency? It doesn't appear that they did. And I'm completely in the dark for a lot of this. I'll explain when I get back into it. But I've had cases where it was absolutely exigent. And I would call the phone company and the phone company be like, well, we don't feel that that is exigent. It's not up to the phone company. Well, and I would tell them, say, okay, well, that's fine. But when we find this victim and they're dead and we can show that they were alive during this phone call that I'm having with you right now, I'm going to be the first person that comes into court to testify against you guys on the civil lawsuit. Like Mm -hmm. you need to understand, I am telling you somebody's life is in danger right now. The records you're holding could potentially save their lives, produce them. And I would usually get the records really quick. Here's the other thing that's really interesting. Child crimes. Child crimes is an automatic exigency. You don't even have to have a search warrant. A lot of people don't realize that. Mm -hmm. They haven't updated those laws. It's still best to run under a search warrant, but there are provisions that allow us to expedite these records when needed. I think any time an exigent request is made, it's always best to follow it up with a search warrant. Yeah. Regardless. 100%. So about six weeks later... (laughs) Remember, this is the first week of September, so now we're towards the end of October. Mm-hmm. Brad calls me back. I haven't talked to him since then. Okay. Hey, remember that phone call about the missing people? Oh, yeah, Brad, what's up? Yeah, we got the phone records back. Do you mind taking a look at them? Yeah, no no, no problem, Brad. Send them over. So Brad sends me the two victims, Kayla and Charlie's phone records, and I load mm-hmm. them up into the system. I start to review them, and I can see when they're in Anderson very clearly, and they have a regular routine of being in Anderson. They travel outside of Anderson from time to time. Mm-hmm. But on the 29th, the day that they allegedly go missing, they drive about 50 miles northeast of Anderson okay. to a very rural area called Woodruff, South Carolina. Had you ever seen their devices there before? Not in the time period that I had. Okay. And it's out in the middle of nowhere. Like we're talking very rural, very isolated parts of South Carolina. Okay. So I call Brad back and I say, hey, based on what I'm seeing, I feel really comfortable they're in this area. By the way, I went to the GIS. GIS is uh, parcels online. So you can actually look at parcels within county records, if you will. Mm -hmm. I look at the parcel and the area they're in is owned by one person. It's about 100 acres. Without a doubt, like, no, they're on this piece of property. Who was the person that owned the property? Yeah, we'll get to that. So I... Tell Brad, hey, here's what I'm thinking. They were last seen alive, at least. Their devices are last working on this piece of land right here. I don't Mm -hmm. know what it means. I don't know how it impacts your case. This is what I'd run with. Did you have a date? I did. The same day they're reported missing. The the day they're last seen, they end up there. And both of their devices disconnect from the network on that piece of property and never reconnect. Okay. Pretty like, hey, oh, by the way, this is 60 days ago. This is suspicious. Yeah, but at this point, I'm thinking we're going to be lucky to recover their bodies. Had they gotten that far in looking at the records, being as they'd actually been to the class? They had looked at them, but if you don't really, you know how it is. If you don't know what you're looking at, Mm -hmm. there's a difference in looking at records and saying, I would look at this piece of property, opposed to looking at the record and saying, I think they're somewhere in the Woodruff area. Right, and it does take time to learn And remember how to interpret each different provider's And this is their first major case with cell phone records. So it's it's understandable. There's Mm -hmm. a lot of nuances here that could come into play. I've got a little picture here for you. It's kind of hard to see, but you see the white arrow kind of down towards the bottom? Mm -hmm. That little white arrow is pointing to a a little clearing in the woods there. The cleared out area below the white area, that's a new subdivision. That wasn't there at the time. Okay. That clearing that the white arrow is pointing to, there's like a little barn structure. Right in the middle there. You can probably see it on your, your monitor there. I can. It's too far away. Yeah. From so right the now. open area to the to the north above the white area is part of the property. And then all the trees kind of oh. north, north, east oh. is all part of it. So it's a okay. big, heavily wooded area. That is big. Okay. And that's the area of interest that I send back to Brad. And I'm like, I would start here. <laughs> This right. is where I would go look. At this point, they start an investigation. They identify the property owner. We'll get to who that is here in just a little bit. They pull the phone records on the property owner as well. Send those back over. So now I've got both victims. How long did it take for them to get the records on the property owner? They went much faster this time, a couple days. Oh. Kind of interesting, right? That is interesting. That's because you had spoke with them. Yes. At this point, we know that, okay, this isn't good. At that point, did you encourage them 
I don't know to- how they expedite. And a lot of times with AT&T in this case, because they already have a case open, you can send additional requests to that same person and process with them the a same lot open case. number. Yeah, process them a lot quicker. So he sends me the owner, the property owner's records back. And on August 31st, when these two go missing, you see the property owner travel to the property at the same time. So they're all arriving at that piece of property relatively within the same time frame. Interesting. Except the property owner leaves later that evening. Hmm. Yeah. So kind of interesting there. So let me clear up the timeline here just to keep everybody on track. August 31st is when they go missing. By the time I get the call from Brad, it's the next week. So we're in the first week of September. Six weeks later, we're getting the phone records back. So we're towards the end of October. Takes three or four days to process those records, get the property owner's records, get those records, evaluate that. We're at 61 days, and I want that to resonate. 61 days since they have gone missing at this point. I've got a little snapshot. This was actually one of the exhibits that were created by the agency, uh, Anderson, and it's going to be Spartanburg County Sheriff's Office on this case. And I realized to the average person, it just looks like a bunch of gunk on the screen here. But those colors all represent different phones. And there's a little pin in the middle that says Coheps Farm. And that's where all these phones come together on the 31st. Now, Anderson PD is who called me, different county. These victims traveled outside of their county into Spartanburg County. So Anderson PD at this point has to do a little jurisdictional update. They drive up to Spartanburg County, meet with the sheriff's department and say, hey, we have this missing person. We want you guys to look at this. So now you're going to get another delay because now another agency is getting involved and saying, well, hang on, we need to look at this holistically. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you dropping on our doorstep here. They try to explain, hey, we looked at the phones, the phones put them here. We feel there's enough to go off the phones. Spartanburg County Sheriff's Office wasn't sold on the phones per se. So they wanted to do some of their own investigation. Had they gone through training on phone stuff? No, but they come to a class after this case. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember that. Yeah. They have a helicopter. So they're going to fly their helicopter over the property. And they believe, based on what they saw from the helicopter, there's a marijuana grow. Oh. It's illegal at this time to grow marijuana in South Carolina. Okay. So they are going to operate under the suspicion that they're investigating a marijuana grow. And they're going to secure some search warrants for a marijuana grow. And did they find marijuana on property? No, there's no marijuana in this house. Oh. I want to start taking you through pictures. We got lots of pictures today. Oh, some of these are going to be really disturbing for some people. Number one, it's a big piece of property. I already said 100 acres. In the middle of this 100 acres, there's this barn-like two-story structure. The bottom is kind of a, a garage area, workshop garage area. And then the top is like a single floor, open floor plan apartment is the okay. best way I can describe it. It's the only structure on the property? Well, there's two other structures. There's a small shed and then there's a connex container, like a shipping connex container, like the metal yeah. put on a train or a boat mm -hmm. back of a semi. When they get in to the apartment, like area of the second floor of the barn, one of the first things they see is there's a bunch of I bolts, U bolts. And basically mm -hmm. there's a bolts that are bolted into the wall with chains attached to them. Mm -hmm. And when somebody bolted them into the wall, they had already put the chain there. So there's these different areas up there that have these eye bolts with chains. Okay. There's a mattress next to one of these. <gasps> which kind of catches anybody's attention, I think, that why is there a chain on the wall next to a mattress? Yeah. Lots of canned food, lots of bottled water. There's a generator. There's no power on the property. So everything is, it's almost like you're camping when you're This there. sounds like my worst nightmare. Yeah, and it's really messy. Oh, yeah, the cleanup. I've got a picture of one of those U-bolts, kind of eye bolts Oh, okay, now that's just weird. What's the black sheet hanging there? That's a drape that he ran across, like, the rafters that I think you could close to give a little privacy. Because remember, it's open floor plan. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure who you're giving privacy from, but yeah, you can see the little bed on the floor next well, to it. Well, it almost appears there's two beds. Is that a sleeping bag with? pillows next to a mattress beds. they're like dog pad beds and then the mattress itself oh but not knowing anything about this case if you walked into somebody's house and you saw that you would probably do a double take i right? would run away if i ever came home and went to go into bed and that was on my side of the bed i'd be like no babe i'm not <laughs> getting in bed with you tonight right yeah like, no. no this isn't happening oh. there was another area not next to the mattress same setup. 
or somebody had a change of stage, right? At any point, you never know when you need a chain. It's kind of balled up there against the wall. Right. It's just perfectly staged so that when I need it, it's there. <sighs> so this is some of the first things that the investigators are seeing when they're serving this warrant, which obviously something's not right. All right. I explained the uh, the small shed and the Connex container. Here's pictures mm -hmm. of both of those, which you can't really see too well on the Connex container. There's two doors, right, on the Connex container, so they kind of open up. Yes. On each door, there's two big bars that lock that door closed. And towards the bottom of those big bars is where the handle locks to the container. So there's four of those handles across the bottom. Sure. All four of them have giant padlocks on it. Oh. And if you look right in the center of that, where the two doors come together, there's like a, a metal box attached to it. Mm -hmm. That's where two eye holes come together when the doors close. There's another big lock through that one for another and then that metal lock. box is around it so you can't even get to that lock you can only yeah. look at it from the bottom to cut it off it's very difficult to cut very off. very difficult to cut off yeah as they're going around this connex container they're making quite the ruckus now right when you serve a search warrant you have to announce police department search warrant funny side story i got sent to training once mm-hmm got shot in the face we've talked about this a little bit well explain what you got shot in the face with uh, it was a blank round, but it was like from me to you, and it totally like tore up my face. I was bleeding all over the place. It was a mess. It was some of the worst training I've ever been to. <laughs> it was put on by a bunch of military dudes who'd gotten out of the military and decided that they were going to teach law enforcement tactics. Mm. And they were terrible. Like, it's the worst training I've ever been to. We had this old commander, just rusty, old fart. <laughs> it was awesome, though. I loved working with him. Commander Blaine. Yes. He used to Captain Morgan us in the locker room all the time. He'd oh. get out of the shower <laughs> and he'd run around naked. So he'd have nothing on and he'd come up as you're getting dressed and he'd put oh. his, he'd hike his leg up on like all of his twigs and berries just hanging out. And he'd be oh. like, hello, tiger, how's it going? And you're like, commander, your penis is right there. Oh, I, I thought he was always just such a nice man. He I was a nice that. man, but he used to Captain Morgan everybody <laughs> in the locker room all the time. It was kind of a running joke. <gasps> So I'm go to this training, I get shot in the face, they're teaching terrible tactics, and we call him, and we're like, please let us come home, the, someone's going to die here. Mm -hmm. He says, Tiger, sometimes the best thing you can learn about training is why you don't do it that way. You'll stay. I had to stay there for two weeks. <laughs> it was terrible, terrible. Where but were you at? It was in Idaho, Boise, oh. Idaho. We were serving a search warrant, like a simulated search warrant was part of one of our exercises, and when our little team did this mock search warrant service. We knocked on the door, we announced police department, search warrant, search warrant, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And then we, we rammed the door. Does the military typically serve? No, search warrants? no. And we actually got critiqued heavily by the instructors about why would you announce that you're going to go through the front door before you go? That's the surefire way to get shot. And we're like, well, there's this law thing that we have to follow in the United States that we have to announce our presence for a search warrant. Point of my story is, is you have to understand at this point when they're, I'm showing a picture now of them grinding on one of those locks on the container. You've got a bunch of cops that have been running around this property yelling search warrant, search warrant. And they've made their presence known and Very clear. well known. They start hearing banging from inside of this Connex container. And if you listen very carefully, you could actually hear a female's voice inside. How close were they to the Connex container when they started hearing this? Do you know? They were just in the air. I think they were next to that little shed. And they're like, wait, hang on. And you could hear the banging much louder than the voice. But when they shut everybody down and told everybody to be quiet, you could actually hear this female voice inside yelling for help. Oh, my gosh. And again, this is summertime in the Carolinas. It's hot. It's humid. Just nasty, right? Oh. In a metal box. Oh my gosh. So they, they actually find a grinder on the property and they start trying to open up this container, but it's actually quite the process because it's locked 15 different ways. Right. And I actually have some video of this. Oh, great. Yes, pull that one first. All right, let them get ready, y'all ready? Come on, guys. Just jam in here. Give me that crowbar back. Where's that? Sure, pump it off. Where's that big crowbar? I need to 
Watch out. Y'all move. Okay. Grab one. Go. Do you have any weapons? Coming through, okay? What's your name? What's your name? Lauren. Lauren. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Just a girl. Just a girl. Just a girl. Just How are you, honey? This we're is bolt cutters. This is our best. He's a paramedic. Oh, yeah. Okay. We're going to get you out of there, okay? Just hang loose for me. Anybody got a, I need a handcuff key. Handcuff key. I don't have I got a right here. Hold up. Y'all slide back. Hold on. He's, He's got, got a light. We got to let him get pictures. pictures. Randy, let, okay. let me see your light, Randy. You can, you can put your hand down. You're okay. We're here, okay? Yes, sir. Just, just sit back. Light on or off? You're fine. We'll get the rest of it here. Let's get her out of here. Okay. We're getting bolt cutters, honey. Don't, don't. You got pictures of the cuffs? No, hold on. Bolt cutters. Did both feet. Just one. Let me see. Okay, it's to a chain from okay. the wall okay. and okay. my neck's attached to the wall up here. Okay. All right. All right, we're going to get you out some more, okay? You got a handcuff, kid. I got no one's in my car. I got no one's in my car. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. No Bolt cutter. No just hit, hit the chain right there. Loose. Just, yeah. just no, just right there at her hand, Brandon. We'll, we'll get it off. We'll get it off here. Cut it right here. Do you know where your buddy is? Charlie? Yes. He shot him. He shot him? Who did? Douche. Todd Colehep shot okay. Charlie Carver three times in the chest, wrapped him in a blue tarp, put him in the bucket of the tractor. Walked me down here. I never seen him again. Okay. He says he's dead and buried. He says there's several bodies dead and buried out here, and he okay. says that the dogs will be ruined if they go looking because there's red pepper. We're gonna step you up, sweet. They're looking because there's what? Red pepper. Okay. Okay. Tell the dog people that. He says no, there's pepper everywhere around. The that is. This is crazy. Like watching them and their entry, which, as you've mentioned before, somebody just drops their water bottle right into them. <laughs> The evidence. Yeah, of I don't know if everybody scene. saw that, but like, the last guy's got a red shirt on. Some of you can go back and watch. He's got a water bottle in his left hand. His gun is in his right hand. And as he walks in, he drops his water bottle on a chair that's inside. So now he just put a piece of evidence in the crime scene. Not oh, good. Well, I wouldn't want to be one of the guys entering while behind someone him, behind me has their gun like ready to go as yeah. I'm entering the. And it's a Conex container. It's pretty small. The other yeah. thing I always get, and I know this is a very screwed up very serious situation but i always get a little bit of a chuckle it took him a while to find a handcuff key because detectives are known for never having a handcuff key on right. them like you just get out of that habit right so as the camera was moving towards her i noticed the books that are sitting there on that little plastic drawer thing what are those books do we know yeah so i've got a bunch of pictures let me kind of walk you through um everything here so let's start with this picture here this is before they started cutting some of the chain. The mattresses she's on right there, they're not mattresses. It's two different dog beds. So she has been living on these dog beds in this Connex container. And like you said, South Carolina, August, and well, now it's November, mm -hmm. but she spent all of September there. Uh, she's got blankets, a pillow. She's got this little white shelf system right there. Mm -hmm. There's a couple books on side. Uh, I've got some pictures of those. We'll zoom into those. But what I want to show with this picture first is she's actually got two chains on her. They're, it's hard to see. She's got one around her neck that's padlocked around her neck. That's the one they cut. She had another one around her ankle. And she actually, it was uh, like a, a handcuff or a leg cuff, if you will, that's around the ankle. And both of them are attached to different parts of the Connex container inside. So they had to get, that's why they were asking for the handcuff key is to mm. get that one off of her ankle that you see there. As far as the books go, they're all true crime books. Oh my gosh. So she's reading true crime. She had a lantern. She had some batteries. Uh, in the top shelf there is a bunch of Ritz crackers. And then she's got a jug of peanut butter, some cranberry juice, and then water. But yes, he would leave her there, go home, which he lives about eight to 10 miles from here. So he would leave her there nonstop. She'd have to basically take care of herself there. And then he would come during the days, let her out, take her into the barn area. And he was sexually assaulting her on a regular basis, sometimes multiple times a day. She has been victimized literally every day since those 63 days we're at now. 
Oh my gosh. Right. This poor girl. If you go back to where we started this episode with exigency, under the right circumstances, we probably should have, could have recovered her 10 days, max. 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 Yeah. Probably within seven. Oh my gosh. Pretty crazy. So I, wanna, I do have, I'm sorry, I have a question here regarding him giving her food and things like that. Oftentimes these types of perpetrators will allow their victims other little gifts, if you will, like bathing or anything like that. Did she mention in any of her interviews if he allowed her those types of luxuries, if you will? You know, I haven't gotten into a lot of her story and there's not a lot out there on that. And I don't know that I want to put it out there, be the first sure. one either. There's probably reasons it's not out there. Yeah. So I don't know about a lot of that history. So you probably heard they asked about her buddy. That's Charlie Carver, her boyfriend mm -hmm. who went missing with her. And he, she says, oh no, he he killed him, shot him in the chest. And they said, mm -hmm. who? That's the first time we hear Todd Colehep. So this yes. is the Todd Colehep property. Mm -hmm. He's a realtor in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Huh. And he is the one who's orchestrated all this. And we're going to get knee deep into everything Colehep here in just a few. If you remember the flyer had a white car on it, Charlie Carver's car was this white Pontiac. Yes. They're going to find the car on the property as well. Okay. And here's a picture of it. It probably looks brown to you. Um, yeah, I see more blue on it. Are those tarps? There's a tarp, yeah. It? There's a blue tarp. But then he he poured either brown paint or brown stain on it to try to hide it, put a bunch of branches on it. Here's another oh. picture of when they're pulling it out, and you can definitely see it's the white Pontiac. To blend it into the environment. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So you heard her talk about Todd Kolhep. Todd Kolhep is the one that she said shot Charlie. At the same time they're serving the search warrant on his property, this rural property, they're also at his house, which is just outside of Spartanburg, South Carolina. So detectives are actually with Todd Kolhep at his house as all this is going down. While they're cutting Kayla out of the box. Yeah. So then they confront him and they let him know, hey, we just found Kayla. Like we know what's up. They're also going to recover an amazing amount of guns and ammo. I want to say maybe a dozen guns from assault rifles down to pistols, some of them with silencers or suppressors thousands and thousands of rounds at his residence yeah well and there was even some at the in the barn area as mm -hmm. well so he's got guns everywhere the neighbors report hearing shots all day and night at the property so he's really into guns which is an alarming issue not because yes. he's got a lot of guns we have some friends who have a lot of guns yeah and they're great people yeah. they're not putting people in conics containers right. on their property that we know of <laughs> The problem with Todd Kolhep having these guns is he is actually a prohibited possessor. He's a convicted felon. Oh, for what? Yeah, funny you're asking me that. This is him? That's him as a young, a youngin. He looks like the boy next door. Yeah, 1986, he lived in Tempe, Arizona. It's right next door. Yeah, he was actually born in Florida. His mom and dad split when he was very young. Mom okay. lived in South Carolina, so he spent some time with mom. He was a total head as a kid. He was constantly causing problems. I want to say he took a hammer to his mom's bathroom and destroyed the entire bathroom right after she remodeled it just because a lot of history of like torturing animals, killing, he killed these goldfish once with Clorox. What? Yeah. He's just a weird a little kid, right? Yes. So mom is going to eventually send him to Tempe to live with his dad. So now he's out in Arizona. Uh, he's 15 at the time. He gets rejected by this girl he goes to school with. So he decides, yeah, I'll kidnap her. And he lures her over to his house or by his house and then forces her into the basement at gunpoint, duct tapes her, sexually assaults her, and then walks her home. Like, oh, it's perfectly normal. Oh, my god. Obviously, gosh. the cops show up that day. They arrest him. He's going to get sentenced to 15 years in prison as a 15 year old and he serves all of his time oh so he, from 1986 roughly to 2001 about the age of 30 then yeah he's yeah. in prison in arizona <sighs> now he is going to attend college courses while he's in prison so he's going to leave prison with an actual degree he moves to south carolina and he's going to get a job as a graphic designer so he moves back to where his mom lived eventually he is going to become not just a real estate agent, but a real estate broker. 
Oh my god. Now gosh. keep in mind, he's been convicted of a very violent sexual offense. He is technically a sex offender. He is supposed to register where he lives. He lied about all that on his broker license application, and then he wrote a letter to the South Carolina real estate agent office, whatever it is. And now he's allowed the intimacy of people's homes where there may be single women or women coming to look at homes by themselves. Yes. And he actually gets his broker's license. So he starts his own real estate company, which is Todd Kohlhepp and Associates. It's TKA Real Estate. And he's doing fairly well. He's making some money. He's got 12 agents that work under him. But everybody kind of thinks he's just a complete ass clown. Like he's very arrogant. He doesn't get along with a lot of people. Apparently, he watches a lot of porn just out in the open. Oh, that's odd. Yeah, weird. Mm. As a sex offender that he would do that. Yeah. Uh, He frequents the Waffle House. He's a big (laughs) fan of the Waffle House. (laughs) And he has an issue with one of the waitresses there because I think he gets over the top with the way he talks to her. And it got so problematic that the when he showed up, the cook would have to come out and take his order because the waitress is like, I want nothing to do with it. Was it just, was it sexual harassment or just harassment generally? I think it's safe to say sexual harassment. Okay. He's going to meet somebody at the Waffle House eventually though. Oh, we'll get there. So the police start interviewing him and this is Spartanburg County Sheriff's office. Once he realizes just how much trouble he's in he's not getting out of prison for this right they've got him on charlie carver's death kayla's been kidnapped for 60 days repeatedly sexually assaulted he's going to prison for life he decides to just take advantage of the opportunity and just clear his soul in 2003 november of 2003 there's this place just outside of spartanburg it's just north of spartanburg almost to the north carolina border and it's the speed shop uh motorcycle shop In November of 2003, somebody walks into this business. There's four employees. There's the owner, his mother, who does books for them, his partner, who's like the lead salesperson, and then there's a mechanic. All four of them are executed, shot in the head, and just left. So another customer shows up after these murders and discovers two of them, calls law enforcement, and it starts this this quadruple homicide investigation. From 2003, we're now in 2016, it's unsolved. So 13 years, Mm -hmm. it's just an unsolved homicide. Todd starts talking about this homicide in the interview and actually gives up, hey, that was me. Oh my gosh. So they're like, wait a second, buddy, tell us more details. And he walks them through details only the person who committed this crime would know. The long and the short of it here is he bought a motorcycle. He wasn't able to ride it. It was too fast for him or there was problems. I don't know. So he took it back, told them he wanted to turn it back in. They wouldn't take it. A few days later, it got stolen from his apartment. And he's convinced that they stole it from him. So he kept hanging out there. He would go and just sit on all the bikes. He's kind of a weird dude. Just wanted a reason to be there. And he felt like they would make fun of him a lot of times. They probably did. Because he couldn't ride the motorcycles. They couldn't do this. Well, he personalized this extreme like to the extreme ultimately he's going to buy a gun it's a beretta Mm -hmm. he's going to college now to get a business degree in 2003 he waits till after his college class drives over there sits on a couple of the motorcycles until other customers leaves then tells them i want to buy this motorcycle so the mechanic wheels it into the back of the office or the wheels it into the back of the shop here and when no one's paying attention he walks to that little back area executes the mechanic as he's working on the bike so he's down working on the bike he comes over the bike shoots him twice in the head the other three hear what's happening start back there he sees them shoots the mom first and in the interview he actually says she was never the intended target just collateral damage because she was there but he almost justifies it and then he said the other two start running away and it's it's really cold the interview's online you can just google it and watch it but he starts to get into they ran the wrong direction as close as they were to him, they should have ran at him, not away from him because it offered him the ability to shoot them. So he kills both of them. Then he starts bragging that he cleared that entire building in 30 seconds. And he tells the detectives like, you guys would be proud of me. I cleared that building in 30 seconds. So he, he completely bragging about it. He sees this as a feather in his cap. It's kind of interesting. It's very grandiose behavior. Well, he starts to reveal yeah. some knowledge about different types of offenders if you will when he bought the motorcycle they gave him a t-shirt and he says i still have the t-shirt 
He's like, but I'm not a trophy guy. And the detective's like, what do you mean you're not a trophy guy? He's like, well, you know, committing my crimes, I don't keep trophies. So he's actually starting to talk about some criminal personality behavioral issues. Right, because he, he's researched it. Yeah, so now we're up to four victims in 2003 that he admits to killing all four, knows intimate details, it's him. Fast forward to December 19th of 2015, Johnny Joe Coxie and Megan Leah McCraw Coxie, husband and wife, they're in their late 20s, they have three children. They bounce around a lot of different jobs. Megan, for a while, worked at Waffle House. He is going to lure both of them to his 100 acres out there. The 100 acre wood. The 100 acre woods to do some work, (laughs) clear some paths, some tree trimming, some different things. Mm -hmm. As soon as they show up there, he immediately pulls out a gun and kills Johnny immediately. Shoots him in the chest, kills him. He keeps Megan for about a week. I'm sure very similar to Kayla. He's sexually assaulting her, keeping her tied up or chained up. Yeah. And then eventually she panics, he says, causes some issues. So he takes her out, shoots her twice in the back of the head, kills her. Oh both of their bodies are also buried on the property. They end up recovering both of them as well. So we've got the four from the motorcycle shop. Now we've got two more from 2015. So now we're at six. Then we'll move forward to Kayla and Charles Carver, or Charlie mm-hmm. Carver. August 31st, 2016 is when he lures them out there. Kayla had actually started working for him before this. She was cleaning houses and doing work around different houses that he was selling. And then he convinces her that he needs some help out on his 100-acre property, and she enlists Charlie. Now, what's interesting to me is on both of these cases, he probably could have lured just Kayla out there, or he probably could have lured just Megan out there. But I think he knew enough to know Megan's husband would have come looking for her. Charlie probably would have come looking for Kayla. So he lures them out there together so he can kill the male half immediately. Well, that's if they even knew where the 100 acre wood was. Yeah, but at least they would have a name or some type of a connection for law enforcement, right? So it's almost this intentional, I need to get rid of their significant other at the same time. Mm -hmm. And Kayla's very graphic about how she describes the interaction between Todd and Charlie Carver. As soon as they pull up, he comes out of the bar and walks right up to Charlie Carver, pulls out a gun, shoots him three times in the chest, like immediately. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So it was very much planned. Okay. He's also known as the Amazon review killer. He thought it was funny. I'm assuming or his, the humorous side of him, if you want to call it that he had an Amazon profile. It was just listed as me. But if you got into the Amazon files, it came back to Todd Kolheb. And he would do these different reviews on products. So, for example, here we've got a chainsaw. He says, works excellent. Getting the neighbor to stand still while you chase him with it is hard enough without having an easy-to-use chainsaw. Did we have actually any reports of neighbors saying that he did this type of thing? No, I think he just kind of thought it would be funny to do this. So, he's got this little collapsible shovel. Keeping the car for when you have to hide bodies that you... And you left the full-size shovel at home. Does not come with a midget. Would be nice to have. These locks at the bottom of this one, though. The master put this pad up. lock. Yeah, these are the type of locks that they cut off the Connex container. So these yeah. are the locks he bought. Solid locks. Have five on a shipping container. Won't stop them, but sure will slow them down until they're too old to care. And those are the actual locks that they cut off the container. The keys to these locks were found in one of his vehicles in the garage of his house. So when they served the search warrants and they made contact with him at the house, they seized both of his vehicles. And in the vehicles were the actual keys to the locks on the Connex container, which is wow. another pretty damning piece of evidence there. A couple more reviews he has here. Uh, one is on a knife. Haven't stabbed anyone yet, yet, but I'm keeping the dream alive. And when I do, it'll be with a quality tool like this. So he gets into that. He's got a little uh, light for a pistol here. Um, Own three of these. They're excellent. And he's got another review for the master padlock. Same type of locks. Now my locks have locks. It's Hotel California. And you know the lyrics from Hotel California where you can check in, but you'll never leave is what he's getting at there. Can you imagine the mindset of somebody to not only write these types of reviews, purchase the items, then actually do all the things that he did. Well, I think you can definitely see the intent 
Yeah, but what I'm, it goes beyond the intent at that point. This guy is f***ing wacko. Yeah, he's out there for sure. Well, he's a serial killer. At this point, yeah. he's killed seven people. And let's be honest, Kayla would have been his eighth victim if she wasn't found when she was. And I don't say the F word like that on this show. <laughs> we'll have to bleep it out. Dirty birdie in your mouth causing yes. us problems again. I know. Now, Todd is going to take a plea deal in lieu of the death penalty. And it's important to note here, the families have all agreed to this. The problem with a, a death penalty is it just opens the door to a ton of appeals. It can take forever. And some of the family that I saw interviews on were just like, we just didn't, we wanted to put it to bed. We just didn't want to go down that road of constant appeal after appeal after appeal. Sure. So the idea here is he got seven consecutive life sentences. So those aren't concurrent. He's got oh. to serve each one individually. Then he gets 30 years for kidnapping of Kayla. Then he gets an additional 30 years for the sexual assault. And this is him in the picture in the blue That's shirt. That's him. So yeah, if we go back a few and I show you this picture of when he's leaving prison in Arizona at the age of 30. Mm -hmm. And then we fast forward, what, about 15 years, we get him to here. Oh, he's looking rough. Yeah, he's looking even more rough now in prison. Oh. He says there's more bodies. They haven't discovered any more yet, but he's claiming that he has killed several other people. I know at one point Tempe Police Department was doing an investigation trying to see if they could attach any other homicides to him. Just a few months, I want to say within six months of the motorcycle shop, there was a big shooting north of there at a bank. And they suspected that he may be involved with this bank as well, but they can't link it and he's never taking credit for it. Mm -hmm. I think if he did it, he would admit to it. He's very braggadocious with yeah. the crimes that he's committed. So yeah. it would make sense to me that if, if he did these others. But yeah, to circle back to the beginning, this case has always kind of haunted me a little bit with our involvement. You know, we would get these calls and I hate to say, it, but you just get in the pattern of answering the phone. How can I help you? Yep, here's what you need to do. Call me when you get the records. Let us know how we can help. And it's too easy to assume that the agencies you're working with know exactly what to do in any given scenario and you don't question them you don't ask hey have you considered this or that what are the circumstances well the assumption is they're running with it right, right. like they're going to do everything they can i i kind of regret not asking more questions getting more involved and really pushing for that agency piece because i it bothers me to know that man we probably could have saved kayla 50 some days earlier than she At was least, yeah. yeah so we incorporated this example into the training right after this and now i push very heavily when you have a missing person until you know that person's dead it's exigent because every minute could potentially matter well and it has surprised me that throughout some of our time with different law enforcement agencies across the country that so many newer detectives and officers don't understand the principles of exigency demands with the search warrant process that's very confusing to them and i think it also is for the providers sometimes yeah it, there's definitely an art form in navigating the system to get the records yeah. you need um but you know the takeaway from our general socialites here i hear it all the time about ah, the 48 hours before you can report somebody missing or yeah there's nothing they can do right now it's all about articulation if you feel that a loved one is missing under suspicious circumstances you need to articulate why it's suspicious this is not in their normal pattern this is completely unlike them i am in fear of their life if you guys don't find them immediately i'm worried they're going to be killed or they're dying as we speak like light a fire there is no law in the world that says we have to wait 48 hours ever. Right. They're just, it doesn't exist. It's all about being able to articulate. And I think sometimes people may err on the side of caution in those situations. Right. And I think the real takeaway here is if a loved one is missing and it is outside of their normal pattern and you are truly concerned, you've got to get the right people involved. You have to articulate why that's an emergency. Right. And I sometimes feel that the person calling in to report the person may oftentimes hide details about that person's life that they're reporting that they yeah. may be fearful to or embarrassed exploit to law enforcement yeah. yeah and for law enforcement i would rather get a hundred missing people cases wrong find them too fast get the records too quick have to explain why we went under agency and the person was fine all along i would rather do that all day long then have this happen. Or what if we were another few weeks delayed and he had killed Kayla? 
or more people. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it's interesting. And, you know, I think there's a lot of other things to dig into with this case. It looks, and I don't want to be overly critical here. There were some links that tied him to the motorcycle shop and he was never seriously looked at with Johnny and Megan. There were links that tied him to both of them. And remember, he's a prior sex offender out of Arizona for a pretty heinous crime. And he was never looked at seriously in that crime. With Johnny and Megan, did they get their phone records at all and see I don't contacts? think they got the phone records, but they knew that Megan had been doing some work for him, very similar that, as Kayla. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a little troublesome. I think if you really dug in here, he probably should have been on law enforcement's radar much earlier. And then mm -hmm. obviously you link some of the Amazon reviews and other things. Mm, it's a little, it's a little hairy. And like I said, I don't want to second guess all of their investigations, but he is somebody who definitely should have been on the radar. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. Great case. And it's been done. This case has been covered several times, but it's kind of interesting to be able to tell from a perspective of being involved in the investigation, what that process was like. Yeah. It's been done by all the major networks. And I can't find anybody who's really questioned the timeline because it just gets explained away as well. It's just this process law enforcement has to go through. Mm -hmm. I know it could have been done six times faster. Like I wish we would have had that insight then and done it different. But hey, in the long run, Kayla's alive. She's well today. Uh, she just sued him, I think last year or his property, his estate. Mm -hmm. and got like a $6 million settlement. Now, wow. he doesn't have that kind of money, so yeah. she'll never see all of that. I don't know how much she will see. But she did sue his estate for mental health damages. Oh, good for her. Well, I wonder, too, if that includes any profits that he might make on telling his story through book rights or movie rights or something Absolutely like that. Absolutely, it will. They also found the guy who bought all the guns for him. I think there was a total of 12 guns, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. So they figured out who he was going through to buy those guns, and they went after him. I want to say he got like eight years in prison, in federal prison, yeah. for the illegal distribution of firearms. Yeah. I love that when victims can kind of exact revenge in the way of monetary gains like that, it does not allow the perpetrator to glorify their story yeah. through telling it or – making a book or a movie because they will see none of those profits back yeah. to them. Yeah, exactly. Well, and his estate won't. So anybody else right. related to him won't. Yes. Uh, I did see an interview with his mom. I think she's just devastated and embarrassed by the whole thing. So, and cause she's known from day one, he's just, a dead. so I'm curious just how surprised she was or if she knew at some point it was going to end like this. You have to wonder with a child that young who acts out in that way. I know this is terrible to say, but, they're kind of born with evil in them. Yeah, he is. You clearly. Know? At some point, you have to call the herd to save the herd. Yeah. There's certain people you just got to get rid of before they oh. exact their evil on the innocence of people who aren't like that. Mm. Yeah, it's a tough topic. Okay, so next week, socialites. Uh, we Try not to sound so excited. We didn't save the life, so to speak, but join us for What the Puck. Have a safe week. Tom is at the Miller's house during the time of the poker game. Right after midnight, around 1210, you see his phone leave their house, their neighborhood, drive out, and it's probably about a 20 minute drive mm -hmm. to Caton to his house. There is no way this crime was committed in that gap of time. I can tell you when I reviewed the phone records and some of the details on this case, and I will still say it today, Tom Clayton did not kill Kelly Clayton.